So we're going to get ready to start. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this town hall to discuss practical solutions to climate change. My name is Randall Garrison. I'm the MP for Climate Sandwich Soup. I'm joined tonight by Murray Rankin, the MP for Victoria. And you'll notice that we have no microphones in front of us. Uh, there's a reason for that, because uh, we're here to listen to you tonight. Uh, the government has, violate, has uh, invited a dialogue on climate change. And so the purpose of this town hall is for us, as a community, to come together and talk about your ideas for what needs to happen uh, to meet the challenges of climate change. Um, we are, of course, holding this uh, town hall on the traditional territories of the Squamal and Salamis First Nations. We thank them for sharing their territory with us, but I would also personally like to thank them for sharing their culture and their values with us on a regular basis. Uh, you'll notice tonight that we have a gender problem in the front. Um, each, group, each group did their own choosing, and uh, uh, there's something about our culture that men tend to get chosen. So what we're going to do to try and balance that out is the first question tonight will have to be from somebody who identifies as female, and then we'll do gender alternation at the mics to get some balance for voice and women. <laughs> so we're going to now have long formal introductions. We're going to have two panelists for 10 minutes each. And then what sometimes is called questions and answers, but I think tonight is more statements and comments than it is questions and answers. Murray and I are happy if there are specific questions we could answer to try and do so, but it's really, uh, as someone said to me on the way in, they said, don't break a leg until you break an ear. Right? So that's what we really want to do, is we want you to fill our ears with the things we need to take back. We have two note takers who are going to produce a summary of what's presented tonight, but I also encourage all of you who speak or who don't speak uh, but want to have an input to also forward your comments into the, the government's process for collecting public input. Uh, some of you know that I'm sometimes cynical about those processes, but I think this issue is so important that we can't let our citizens stop us from taking every action we can to get effective action on climate change. So I think uh, if I don't follow these, I always forget something important. Um, So let me just say that um, there is a larger debate that we could have, and we may have tonight, it's up to you, about targets and plans. Uh, and that's an important debate. But I find for a lot of people, and even for myself, sometimes that debate is disempowering. It's about such abstract things, and it's about setting goals that sometimes people say are not achievable. So that's why tonight we put the title Practical Steps. Because there are positive things that happen and are happening. Maybe they're not enough, maybe they're not fast enough, but there are things that can be done. There are some unexpected things that have happened. For instance, the Alberta government in Canada went from being a climate denier to one of the leaders on provincial plans for climate change. Maybe not enough, uh, maybe not the right things for some of you, but it's a huge change uh, in what's happened in Alberta. Uh, if we look at the European Union, uh, there was lots of sparring and disagreement over what to do about climate, and France just announced that no matter what happens with the rest, they're going to go to uh, carbon tax of $45 Canadian a ton. They're just going to go ahead and do it and have the others try to catch up. And in BC, the provincial government appointed, uh, I guess a year ago, a climate leadership team representing a broad spectrum of people in the community. And that team came forward with consensus, a consensus action plan which would move us a long way toward the existing targets. Is that enough? You tell us. Is it the right things? Uh, you tell us. Though, um, We've got a long ways to go, and I think we all know that, and that's why we've got such a great turnout in this community tonight. So, without further ado, without a long introduction, I'm going to let panelists uh, say what they like about themselves. Uh, we'll start with Will Harder from the government. Uh, oh, um, I'm the newly created director of strategy. I used to be executive director, and I've been there for 16 years. I'll describe what all it is at the beginning of my presentation, so I'll turn over to Paul. Thank you. I'm Tom Hackney. I'm the Policy Director for the BC Sustainable Energy Association. <laughs> One group that we promised tonight was the Geo, uh, Geothermal Energy Association. Unfortunately, the representative has the flu and is, couldn't get himself out of bed to get here as much as he wanted to be here. So that's why we're down to two. That means more time for the rest of you. But we're going to miss some important uh, input from the Geothermal Energy Association. 
Sorry. Bill, you want to go? Thank you, Will. Uh, can everybody hear me clearly? Yes. And, and I wouldn't mind if the house lights were up a little bit. It's actually nicer to be able to see the audience. So, uh, thank you, Randall and Murray, for hosting this town hall meeting, and thank you everybody for coming out and showing your interest in this important issue. As I said, my name is Tom Hackney, and I'm the policy director for the BC Sustainable Energy Association, and our group is committed to uh, fostering a general changeover from our current fossil fuel use to uh, a society where fossil fuel sort of thing in the past and we get our needs met by renewable energy and energy conservation. So I've been talk, asked to talk about quick and practical solutions to climate change. I'll do that briefly. Many of you probably already know what the solutions are. And I'm also going to address the political dimension in a couple of ways. First of all, we do need to talk about the targets and the greenhouse gas reductions and what our leaders need to do to lead effectively and make sure that society as a whole gets moving in the right direction and, in other words, organize for, you know, how quickly do we need to get fossil fuel vehicles off the road and replaced by uh, electric vehicles and bicycles and so on. That's something that everybody has to organize, you can't do it one at a time, one individual at a time. And second, we need to talk about motivating and supporting our political leaders to take those actions. And so I will talk a little bit about motivation because climate change is a huge challenge and it's very easy to distract ourselves with denial and so on. Uh, you know, can we move forward as a society and grapple with this? Can we make those big changes? So in a couple of minutes I'll end up giving a positive answer to that. But I'll frame the question a bit right now. We're here tonight, at least in part, at the suggestion of the Federal Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Catherine McKenna, who asked uh, the uh, members of Parliament to host town hall meetings like this and get public input on federal climate action. So this is very timely and important, and uh, I hope we can all make the best use of this opportunity to give our leaders the feedback that they need. The Trudeau government has kept its first and easiest promises on climate change. Canada did take a positive role in Paris last December and helped to achieve the historic international agreement of 165 countries that uh, we would limit climate change below 2 degrees Celsius and aspirationally below one and a half degrees and that we would develop climate action plans to achieve those goals. The, uh, <clears throat> the Prime Minister can, has convened a, a meeting of provincial and territorial premiers and uh, in the words of uh, Naren Smith, the uh, Executive Director of Clean Energy Canada and uh, climate activist extraordinaire Having all First Ministers across Canada agree to that climate change requires unified and ongoing efforts and confirm that meeting Canada's climate targets must remain a priority is a big step forward. So there they are. The guys and, and, and some women who are, who are uh, trying to get them back together. <laughs> And uh, the communique uh, was, was quite positive, um, and uh, although I, th I think you'll, you'll notice this tendency to try and, and assert <coughs> renewable 
economic growth first, and then climate change is going to slid in as an aside. So Canada stands at the threshold of building our clean growth economy. This transition will create a strong and diverse economy, create new jobs, improve our quality of life, as innovations in steam power, electricity, and computing have done before. We will grow our economy while reducing emissions. We will capitalize on the opportunity of low carbon and climate resilient economy. And the Vancouver Declaration that came out of the First Minister's Conference is actually surprisingly positive and contains some fairly trenchant commitments. So there is a, a definite recognition that there's a need to increase the level of ambition of environmental policies specifically to, to get a plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions consistent with the Paris Agreement. Uh, in short, uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions um, and a transition to a low carbon economy by adopting a broad range of domestic measures, including carbon pricing mechanisms. So the, uh, the, the First Ministers uh, agreed to set up working groups, a working group on clean technologies, Clean Technology, a working group on carbon pricing mechanisms, a working group on specific mitigation opportunities, and one on adaption and climate resilience. Covering the spectrum of things that need to be addressed, and they will be reconvening in the fall, this fall, to finalize a pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change and review progress on the Canadian energy strategy. So that this is what this current meeting feeds into, and uh, this is our opportunity to, to make the issue as big as we want to make it. So what should we tell uh, the Prime Minister and the provincial and territorial leaders? First, the standard advice for encouraging politicians is to thank them for their good work so far and to encourage them to do a lot more. I would take the First Ministers at their word and tell them they're going in the right direction. They need to hear this because there will be lots of other voices pointing out all the short-term traditional economic costs of taking action on climate change. We know the Trudeau government is conflicted over pipelines and the BC coast. That's because of the huge economic and political pressures. So remember, serious action on climate change is a new thing for everybody, and everyone will feel very insecure around it. So there needs to be a voice of encouragement and reassurance that our politicians are hearing loudly. Um, a glaring emission from Canada's current plan is a target that will take us where we need to be by 2050, which is virtually decarbonizing society. Uh, this is acknowledged by the First Ministers, and we should encourage them to set that target. Uh, second, we need to recognize some of the foreseeable loopholes that will come, become temptations and tell our leaders that we are aware of them. So I, I mentioned this, that you saw this linking of economic growth to climate action. So yes, a healthy economy is important, but we do really need to focus on what actions we need to take to stop climate change from running away on us. Uh, we're getting the fires in Fort McMurray. That's just the start of how bad things will be. We do need to start really focusing on climate action. Uh, so we should not be saying that climate action is, a, is conditioned on first getting economic growth. And another, uh, another possible loophole, carbon trading and clean tech credits. 
let's be careful about fancy mechanisms uh, to say that we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We really do need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So third, uh, we can talk about specifics. We need to cut emissions in all the ways that we use energy and in all sectors of society. So uh, let's electrify the vehicle fleet. fleet. That's great. We need to go a lot further and include mode shift. So uh, a lot more bicycling and walking instead of driving cars. And that in turn has very big implications for how we plan and design our communities and how we design how we need to get goods to where we are. Freight transportation it is very difficult to electrify. Uh, currently, governments are talking about switching our freight, our trucks off of diesel fuel and onto natural gas. Good for air quality, not nearly sufficient to cut the greenhouse gases that we need to cut. And uh, by the way, we need to give up on flying. That's a big one. <laughs> This is, uh, this is what is called a complete street, a uh, new form of urban design that is trying to uh, get as many different modes of transportation and use out of the streets and reduce the need for motor vehicles. Uh, buildings, yes, we need a national, provincial and local programs to make our buildings way more energy efficient. Here in Victoria, the Bernhardt contracting has shown that the passive house design using uh, minimal heating systems can be built at a, an insignificant cost premium relative to, to our current practices. We need to, we need to adopt that and, and you can really reduce your energy needs for your houses if you do that. We need to electrify our society generally. BC's energy use, uh, total energy use, is now roughly four fifths fossil fuel energy and one fifth electricity. And electricity is mostly greenhouse gas free, but of course, in fossil fuels, is not. Um, so we we need to go in this direction big time. And uh, wind and solar energy have great potential. And, to the end. and fourth, we need to reinforce the message of encouragement to go in the right direction. The changes we need are really big changes. Ordinary pr political pressures to waffle are huge. It's difficult for us all to change, but particularly difficult for leaders who are being constantly pressured to go slow and do nothing. They do need our help. So I hope you'll all get involved. And uh, just like to note that at the back, uh, at the entrance lobby, uh, the BC Sustainable Energy Association has a table with petitions. This is a municipally de directed uh, petition, but it's, it's, all, it's all good. We need action at all levels of government. This is asking our municipal governments to adopt a 100% renewable energy goal by 2050 for their communities. So. Let's make it happen, and thank you. Um, and from the very beginning, we've been kind of a different kind of a group. 
Um, although we're often described as an environmental group, I actually think we're much more of a democracy group. Because we work at the intersection of where democracy, the environment, land reform, and indigenous rights all kind of come together and merge. We're trying to find those places where if we can pull on those threads, we can pull on all those different issues simultaneously. And the things we focus on is kind of who decides, who gets to make the decision about whether a certain project would go forward, who gets to decide where the benefits are going, what are the rules that would apply. This is the general situation in British Columbia, you know, just on an average day. You've got scattered people, often with good, uh, good ideas, facing some fairly formidable predators. Um, you know, people with lots of money, lots of resources. Um, and so the, the essence of Dogwood Initiative is trying to help local people come together, define the common good, and take action to make it happen. And the idea is that if we do that, we can create some significant obstacles. So our job is, you know, we're in constant pursuit of those ephemeral moments when people come together and do something greater than themselves. And our goal is ultimately... Can I offer assistance? stabilize the carbon tax and it's not going to change and diminish some of the other policies. So although for a period of time those previous policies were able to turn the curve downward, it's now started rising again. And that's the problem. <coughs> so BC's domestic emissions amount to about 64 million me metric tons a year. Million metric tons a year. And this includes uh, the emissions and the pollution, the carbon pollution from all the sources, domestically, all transportation, all our buildings, our industry, our agriculture. The proposal that the climate action team brought forward, the recommendations that they've made that the, that the province has not responded to, would attempt to take slices of those 64 million metric tons off the table over the next period of years to try to bring us in line with our legislative target for 2020, which they said would be very difficult to achieve. More, and so they put forward another target for 2030. So they propose things like reducing um, the transportation sector's emissions by about 30%, which would lower it by about 6 million metric tons. 30% for the industrial sector as well, which would be a lowering of about 8 million metric tons. Um, um, in, environmental building targets are on you know, new, new uh, bylaws and uh, building standards, which would lower by about 50% by about 3.4 million metric tons. Um, but what I wanted to do is show you, put that in perspective, this 64 million 
magic tongues in terms of what's the, the other things that are happening in British Columbia and in Canada that are not included in that. And that is, so this is that's that, that high end of my technical abilities. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, is British Columbia is essentially becoming in the crosshairs for fossil fuel exports. So BC is becoming the place where the battle around what's going to happen to stranded assets, not only here potentially in BC and in Alberta at the tar sands, but also Alberta's coal and the Powder Bay River Basin's coal, that can't get itself to market very easily. Um, we become ground zero for you know a whole host of projects. We can probably spend the whole day just listing them here for the rest of the time. <coughs> So I want to talk about a couple of those projects and put that into perspective of you know, what the priorities need to be going forward in terms of reducing uh, emissions. And remember, emissions, it doesn't matter where they're from. The rules uh, are written such that you only count the things that are actually burned in your, in your actual jurisdiction. But we in Canada are responsible for a lot of things that, that ultimately result in carbon emissions but actually don't actually happen within our jurisdiction. And the first one I want to talk about is Fraser Street Docks. So Fraser Street Docks is a coal port um, where they would ship thermal coal from Powder River Basin essentially to China. Um, and it's been proposed for the last couple of years, it was, it was supposed to be rubber stamped a couple of years ago. It would account for uh, it's 8 million metric tons of coal annually, ultimately, and that's about 22.4 million metric tons of emissions annually. So that's about a third of what BC's domestic. Uh, emissions targets are so you know we can go we can go a long way and we're going to have to do that to reduce our domestic emissions and I gave you some examples of what the, the climate action team is proposing all of those proposals don't add up to one year of 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 uh, Fraser Surrey docks pollution that would result from the coal that comes out of there. The next project I want to talk about does anybody know what this is? That's the port over by the ferries in Suwasan. Yeah, that's the West Shore terminal. That's the largest, close to the largest coal export facility on North America. It's in a race with Norfolk, Virginia, for who's the largest coal produ producing uh, or exporter on, on the continent. Um, it is responsible annually for 104 million metric tons of coal annually, which is about 160 percent of more than or than uh, than BC's domestic emissions from all other sources. So part of our coal campaign is to start taking a look at, you know, hey, what about this? And they're, they're proposing to add another 22 million metric tons of capacity to that project. <coughs> the next proposal is Northern Gateway, Enbridge's project. So Enbridge, this is a project that was approved uh, a little bit more than a year ago, a uh, year and a half, almost two years ago now. And uh, it's it's a city now with it's two, about 209 conditions, and it will produce annually about 96 million metric tons of pollution. This is at its current capacity. What they haven't been telling you is the actual pipes that they're building would actually produce a significant, allow a significant more bitumen than they're currently proposing at 525 um, barrels a day, 525,000 barrels a day. Um, the next project is. The Kinder Morgan. Now, this is a photo of the Kinder Morgan spill that happened in 2007 in Burnaby. Um, the Kinder Morgan project, which is larger than it, is that's not right. It's supposed to be that should be 126 million. I think the one got cut off. Um, so yeah, 126 million metric tons annually from that one project. And then you've got the existing Kinder Morgan facility, and most people haven't been talking about this, but this used to produce 8 to 12 tankers a year. Um, it's up to 4 or 5 a month now. Um, and it is, results in 55 million metric tons of pollution annually. So that's almost as much as domestic emissions from all other sources in, uh, in British Columbia, just from that one facility. Um, so here we go. Uh, this is her making an announcement as part of the climate pollution plan. And what you'll see is 
that so far, the time that we spent, those of you who've worked, and I know some of you have, to stop Enbridge and to stop Kinder Morgan and to work to stop coal, we've delayed these projects from being implemented. Uh, Kinder Morgan, I mean, uh, Enbridge by six years, um, Kinder Morgan for two years from their original in service date, and two years for the Freestore Docks. If you add up the emissions that we've stranded so far, that's 896 million metric tons of GHGs that have not been burned, which is 14 times British Columbia's domestic emissions. <laughs> That comes to you know almost 600 million metric tons just from Enbridge by itself, and uh, Kinder Morgan is 252. And so the point that I'm trying to make here is there's been lots of conversations about carbon pricing, and it's super important, right? Like we, we need to get a, put a price on carbon. I have my own views on what's the best way to do that, um, but it's a minuscule slice of carbon globally compared to these export projects. So you've been reading in the newspapers for the last month or two you know, carbon pricing versus pipelines, as if those are synonymous. And what these numbers show you is that those two things are not equal. Carbon pricing, although important and probably one of the better mechanisms to start reducing emissions, is only going to take a teeny, teeny slice of emissions as compared to these new export projects. And so it's not a trade-off. You know, the globe is in really significant problem. I mean, it'll be better off if Canada brings in carbon pricing across the country, and the, the tougher it is, the better. But in compared to what our exports are doing in terms of in terms of pollution, they're a drop in the bucket. So we can't allow a conversation to go forward politically where it's okay, we'll do carbon pricing, but we get to build a new tidewater uh, bitumen pipeline. The trade-off is just not worth it, and the, and the climate cannot sustain that. Given that the scientists are saying essentially we're going to have to leave two-thirds of our you know the easily accessible economic uh, oil and gas projects. Uh, in the ground, we have to leave it in the ground. So just to finish off real quickly, um, here is some charts of, the, of what the GHG emissions are from these various different projects on an annual basis. As you'll see, I think there's a. So that's the line. The, the stuff that's over the line is more than we produce annually. Right? So the lines are what the annual emissions are. It shows you how much more is being produced from these other projects. So it wouldn't be produced. There's, there's the extent of money. <laughs> <laughs> this is when you look at it in terms of what's happened so far. So that's BC's annual emissions versus what these other projects, if they come online when they were intended to come online when they were originally promised to come online. If we, if we stop these pipelines from being built, there's an organization called Oil Change International which has done some calculations and they say that the, the stock of the, the three proposed pipelines out of Alberta right now would account for 35.6 billion, million, billion metric tons of carbon to be stranded. And to put that in perspective, the scientists are saying we have about 205 um, uh, billion metric tons that we can actually burn under the carbon budget. This is about 17% of all of humanity's carbon budget that would be kept in the ground by not building these pipelines. So these trade-offs that are being discussed as part of the climate plan is, oh, we need to get bitumen into tidewater and we'll bring these policies to, you know, to, to free up our oil. It's just not a good trade-off. The, the planet cannot sustain that trade-off. And, you know, the, the, the sleight of hand is that none of these emissions are actually counted domestically in British Columbia. So, you know, so our emissions, the battle to reduce our domestic emissions, whether it's in BC and across Canada, while very, very important, is just a, is just a ripple in the larger climate uh, uh, battle. And, and our the Canadian responsibility primarily is to keep our exports in Canada. And if we do that, we'll do much more to reduce global climate than, than you know, a lot of the heavy lifting that's going to continue to have to happen domestically. So I think that's about it. Um, so that's last slide here. And what are we going to do about it? How do we do that? Um, so there's three ways that we're going to be able to keep carbon in the ground. 
and move on, move towards renewables. Um, one is First Nation rights and title. Uh, First Nation rights and title is kind of the backstop on all of these kind of just say no campaigns. But they're also moving on the just say yes campaigns to different kind of renewables. Some of the First Nations in BC are in the leadership and in, in trying to make those conversions and maybe be supported. Um, the second one is political organizing. So that's the First Nations. This is just a map of the um, image. Second thing is political organizing. This is something that Dogger takes very seriously. Um, this is kind of a quote that was from a retiring MP. I, I don't know exactly who it was, but it was a survey that was done a year or so, a couple years ago. And they said, there's only two kinds of, of people in the world. People who can hurt me in my own writing and everybody else. Um, and, and it's most simple. This is what politics is about. And as you move towards more micro targeting, as the parties become you know, much more engaged in kind of micro targeting, and the conservatives are probably in the forefront of that um, historically. This is going to become even more true, I think. Um, and so this is this philosophy that Dogwood has taken is just get really strong in some of the key writings where we've got, you know, uh, that are going to be in play, whether they're the swing writings or they're important to government because they're cabinet or they're party writings, and, and get very strong there and, and play hardball with all the parties to make sure that it doesn't matter which party gets elected, that they move this agenda forward. And I think. You know, that involves lots of organizing. I think we've got 32 teams operating. Uh, I mean, we've got multiple teams operating in about 32 ridings across the province. Now our goal for the end of the year is 45 before the provincial election comes along. And the last piece that I wanted to talk about really, really briefly is the money side of the equation. So, um, you know, we have the Wild West in British Columbia in terms of uh, provincial campaign finance rules. There really isn't any. Uh, corporations and unions can give money, and they give lots of money. Um, uh, foreigners can give money. Uh, anonymous people can give money. So I like to say that Osama bin Laden could have been giving money to the BC Liberals for a long time, and we wouldn't even know it. Um, so you know, there's been this has been in the news a lot. Dog just announced our Bam Big Money campaign, and, and I just wanted to identify some of the numbers on this because it's it's pretty startling. This is the breakdown of money that's been given from the companies that I've just been mentioning and the projects I just described into the political process. And you'll notice a couple things from this. One, the BC Green Party hasn't gotten any. Um, and the NDP has gotten a little teeny bit. Um, it comes to less than 20, it's like 20 to $30,000. Almost all of that came in the 2011 through 2013 window when the companies thought that they were going to be in the government. Virtually none of that has come since then. Um, and then you get to the Liberals, and the numbers are so big that the scale didn't even really fit on the page, right? And the, the, the biggest one of that is Tech Tomenko Coal Company, largest number of the Liberals, which is why we have very coal-friendly policies in British Columbia. They've given uh, you know, over $2 million to them. Um, but the numbers are pretty stark. The Fraser Street Docks, that coal proposal, 82,000. Um, Kinder Morgan, 30,000. Uh, West Shore, which is the coal terminal, 34,000. BNSF, the railway that moves the coal, 14,000. Uh, Enbridge, 128,000. So, that means I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, maybe we 
we are, and I just didn't speak into it enough. I'm sorry, I'm short. There. Um, and I also want to get uh, a little bit of self-consciousness aside. I'm wearing a dress because I'm going to dance after. This is not my usual uniform. <laughs> so thank you all for your presentations. I learned a lot, and uh, you, you gave me some additional perspective to what I want to say. Um, my name is Patty Whitehouse. I'm from a chosen rambling or writing. Um, and what I have to say is probably not new to anybody in this room, but uh, it's perspectives that I don't hear brought out very much, so I wanted to make this statement. First of all, I think that the uh, uh, developing an effective progressive strategy on climate change is the most important task of every level of government anywhere in the world right now. The classic um, objection, which uh, you commented on, Colin, is that environmental protection and climate change action are okay as long as it doesn't hurt the economy. Do people not realize that um, climate scientists have been wrong in general terms so far, only in terms of the speed with which climate change is happening? They underestimated it dramatically. So just how long is the economy going to last when we have fires in Fort McMurray and Kelowna and we have floods on, in Manitoba, we have hurricanes in the Maritimes and we have ice storms in, uh, in Ontario every year. And that's coming. Um, so the cost to the economy of not acting on climate change is far greater than the cost of that. The other concern that's raised so many times is uh, the number of jobs that would, would be lost as we move out of the fossil fuel economy. So, just how many key punch operators do you know? Times change, jobs change. Um, there was no outcry when the key punch operators uh, lost their jobs because of changing technology. There was no attempt to protect their jobs. I don't understand what there is in any um, uh, economy rather than move to what's coming next. And of course, good news is that there are many more jobs in renewable energy than the fossil fuel energy. There are better jobs. There are better jobs. They also pay well, but much more important is they keep people in their communities and with their families. Um, the social and cultural investment uh, that, that people make when they live where they work far exceeds what happens with jobs that take people away from the communities and families. And to me, the, the obvious and simple answer, of course nothing simple, is uh, what Will was talking about just a minute ago. The obvious answer is no new infrastructure. We know that we will need to carry on with, with fossil use of fossil fuels for some time to come. We know that we need to reduce it dramatically, but without, um, if, if we keep on building new infrastructure, we will keep on putting off the shift to the renewable uh, energy economy. What we need to do is put on pressure to change by having no new infrastructure. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you, Will and Tom, for your excellent presentations. My name is Howard Green. I'm the EB of UCOR, Urgent Climate and Ocean Rapid Response. I'd like to just say a few words for those that uh, are intending on making a, a submission to either the federal or provincial climate action plans, and it's this, is that if you're finding yourself in a deep, dark hole, the very first thing is you've got to stop shoveling. <laughs> and certainly our Prime Minister on Wednesday with the G7 leaders uh, forgot that lesson because he, he did dig a hole, he did plant a tree, but he also uh, declared that fossil fuel subsidies 
which the IMF has pegged at 5.3 trillion, will continue for another decade. And that decade is only for those subsidies that are, well, when they review them again, it, it uh, is in respect to inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. So just what, what that means, God, God only knows, right? Is that it's business as usual. And clearly what's going on right now, most of us are, are suffering climate apocalypse fatigue. I know I am. Uh, the only thing that keeps me going probably is the, the deniers that are challenging me every, every hour of every day. Uh, and I'm sure anybody that's uh, uh, dealt with trolls, uh, it's, it's endless. They're, they're well paid and they're, they're, they're in huge numbers. Anyway, what's happening is clearly we are in a climate and ocean emergency. And that is what both our politicians and our corporate leaders have to wrap their head around. It's not something that's at the end of the century, it's not at 2050, it's not at 2030, it's at 2016, it's already begun. Runaway climate change is happening now. We just have to witness the fact that there's mass graves being dug now in Pakistan for the upcoming heat wave they're expecting. The oceans, in 2030, beginning in 2030, the North Pacific Ocean is not only acidifying, not only suffocating, not only rising, not only warming, but it, it is expected, according to the National Atmospheric Research Center, to probably not have enough dissolved oxygen for fish life. And, and, and we go on. You know, in Canada we hit uh, the 411 parts per million CO2. They, you know, 350.org coined their name at 350. Look at where we're at now. Where are we going to be when the next El Nino occurs? It's shocking. It's appalling. It's alarming. And, it's, and for many of us, it's quite depressing. So the only thing that we can really uh, do to ignite the political will is to begin by expecting and demanding actions that are befitting of a global emergency. And we're not, we're not getting it. Also, thank you for this evening. Uh, a few of us uh, last week attended a really interesting session called Extreme Oil. And how many people were there? Yeah, quite a lot of us were there. And it, was, it was a very good presentation. And it was sponsored by University of Victoria and the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And I wanted to highlight a few of the things that came out of that session because for me, they were really useful in terms of providing a base language for this new political climate that we're dealing with with Trudeau uh, that in some ways is just as challenging as the one we had with Harper. Maybe not as evident, but still there are challenges. So one of the things that we discussed in this was the new way of framing the extractive industry, the oil industry, and his definition was to call it progressive extractivism. And I thought that was a remarkable way of expressing what's happening because the justification for progressive extractivism is that you carry on as usual by justifying that the taxes that are taken from extracting and continuing to extract oil are a justification because you then say that you're going to use those taxes to go sustainable. And it goes to your point, I think, about um, the continuation of pipelines being unacceptable in this frame. Um, and so he also looked at looping together the, the various forms of energy in a political way to map how the, uh, the fracked industry, the fracking industry, is related to need for energy from Site C and how Site C is being built 
to link to providing energy to the tar sands. And so within that, there's a discussion that we're providing sustainable energy and we're really not. So I think we have to be aware of what governments are telling us about sustainable energy. So that was the first point. Um, the first two points, sorry. The, the other point he made, which I thought was really important, we don't discuss enough of, is that it's fine to say, let's switch to sustainable energy, but should we not also be talking about reduction in energy usage? Because if we're gonna say that sustainable energy is kind of 50-50, well, that means that we're equating it to 100% of energy we're using now, instead of saying, no, let's reduce the energy we're using now and then provide sustainable energy, but not build sustainable energy to the 100% use we have right now. Let's reduce the energy. So I thought that was a really interesting point that I don't think we're discussing that. And another point that came out, and I'll make this the final point so other people can have their time here, is that uh, it was emphasized at that meeting that the oil industry right now cannot survive without subsidies. It just cannot. So the flip side of that, if that's true, we know it is, is one, should we not be messaging the government to pull those subsidies? Or if we're going to give subsidies, should not those subsidies be going into sustainable energy? And I think that's a good I think that's a key, a key thing, that we need to start focusing much more on that. Um, not only on the campaign donations of these big folks, which Dogwood's going to be taking the lead on, um, and hopefully finding partners on, but also on the subsidy side. And one of the things that I, this is going to be, it's, I'm hesitant to even say it, because I think it's, it's going to be hard to say this in a way that doesn't seem a bit abrupt, but one of the biggest battles that's going to come up in the very near future is about subsidizing the rebuilding of Fort McMurray. So there's going to be massive attempts. I mean, just imagine this. So my my uh, um, um, my ex-wife has a, a very good friend whose family lives in Fort Mac, and the blog of them fleeing the fires is on our website, and how terrifying that was. And luckily, their house didn't burn down. But we started thinking about it. I mean, her and her husband are you know senior engineers working in the oil patch, and they probably together make you know, over $200,000 each, and they're probably the top 0.5% of Canadian income earners. They're a few years away from retirement, um, you know, maybe six or seven years, and do they go back, if their house had burned down, do they go back and rebuild? At a time when everybody in the whole place is trying to rebuild and the cost of construction is going to be through the roof? Or do they take their cash and move someplace else? And so there's going to be, re I mean, there's a lot of people going to be facing those kind of dilemmas, and the, the question, is going to be enormous pressure on our both federal and state and I mean provincial governments to provide massive subsidies to the people who want to go and rebuild Fort Max just the way that it was. And the question is, is that really in the best interest of Canada, in the best interest of Fort McMurray, in the best interest of the climate? I don't, I'm not so sure about that. And I think we need to have a strong conversation about it because I think when that comes up, it's going to be very unpopular to be telling people, we're not going to let you go back and rebuild to this scale you were, it doesn't make any sense. And um, there's gonna be, you know, the, the forces that wanna do that are gonna put enormous pressure and they're gonna try to guilt us into being silent. And I don't think we can be. So I just wanted to put that on in terms of a different kind of question. Thank you very much. I don't pretend to be anywhere near as eloquent or as informed as any of my predecessors. However, I do have something to say. Can we remain? Rob and Thank you, dear. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we have elected two of the people up here at the front to sit in Parliament and stand for us and bring forth our values to the Canadian people. Diaspora as a whole. 
And I feel that Canadians as a whole are being ignored. They are being ignored terribly. If you had cancer, lung cancer, and your neighbor had lung cancer, but your neighbor on the other side owned a cigarette store, would you campaign to close your neighbor's store to save yourselves? Or would you continue buying cigarettes? We have got a global cancer. It's called carbon pollution. Yet we continue to foster the cigarette store, Fort McMurray. We are subsidizing that place. We're subsidizing our uh, <coughs> greenhouse, not the liquid natural gas, liquefied natural gas. We're polluting the groundwater in order to get liquefied natural gas here. But to burn liquefied natural gas, it's not as polluting as diesel, but it still kicks off greenhouse gases. We've got to get away from that. We've got to stop polluting our world, your children's world. We've got to stop killing people for our own financial benefit. That's what we've got to stop doing. And as politicians, you two gentlemen have to stand up and oppose every single thing that doesn't stand for getting rid of Harper's legacy. And that's the legacy of pollution and climate denial. presenters for holding this event tonight and for participating in it and inviting us. Um, I, I feel like I wanted, uh, wanted to stand up and say that uh, I think it's uh, from the presentations I was reminded again that really it seems like what's at the very bottom of this effort is conservation and it does seem like that's a, a piece that doesn't get talked about quite enough. All of the talk about infrastructure and, and, um, and subsidies is all really important too but if we're not personally uh, invested in reducing greenhouse gases, then it's not going to change. And if, if we can't be a model for other people in the world to reduce their consumption, then things are not going to change. So I would like to encourage you to MPs, as part of the Climate Action Plan, to do whatever you can to encourage conservation and to encourage the kinds of measures that, I believe that his name is Tom, yeah, from the uh, Sustainable Energy Initiative, what he was talking about. Things like uh, putting energy efficiency into homes. Small things, even small things. Subsidies, incentives, you know, paying people to get on their bikes, paying people to make their homes energy efficient, uh, paying for uh, a, a mass transit so that we're not all driving. Somebody mentioned not flying, right? How, how, can, we, how can we spread the word? Even education around how massive a problem the flying all around the world is causing in terms of greenhouse gas, and uh, it's there are just so many things that we're not we're not thinking about in our day to day life that we have to be. Somebody mentioned that we have to be living like this is truly a crisis right now today, and it is. And we're not. I would I would venture to guess that most of us are not living every day as though we're in crisis. Yeah. So we need the help of our government, right, to put incentives in place to help us to take the steps that we need to take in order to change that. And I'll just give one small personal example. We just did a very uh, comprehensive renovation on our house, which included a lot of energy upgrades. It was incredibly expensive. And part of the expense was uh, was working with the city around codes, a city whose, in, whose, um, whose council doesn't even understand energy efficiency and who, who couldn't even, their codes didn't even, uh, didn't, we didn't comply in ways that didn't even make sense because we exceeded the requirements of the code. So things like that. And then an energy subsidy that we applied for, we spent days pulling together all the information and writing up this application 
for, uh, uh, for an, an incentive, that the, an energy efficiency rebate that we're probably not even going to get because of the bureaucratic uh, issue having to do with the application. So making it easier for people to... <laughs> Around, uh, around energy efficiency and just conservation in general. So thank you again. The next person to identify as a female to come forward. That's what gender alternation means. You get to skip some of the guys. Okay, please go ahead. Hi, um, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Jerry Gados. Uh, I'm, I live in Sandwich. Um, I'm an electric vehicle and solar energy uh, advocate and promoter. Um, first of all, thanks very much, Tom, for your presentation. You hit on a lot of the points that I firmly believe in. And uh, um, Will, you outlined some things that I wasn't fully aware of. I wasn't aware of the magnitude of carbon exports in Canada. And we certainly need to say no to all of that. Uh, but I, on the other hand, I appreciate the points that Tom made regarding the things we need to say yes to. Um, a couple of points that I'd like to, um, I'd like to um, speak to that are not specifically about energy, but, but will get us closer to solving this problem if we address them properly. Um, first of all, uh, the timeline that we've got to solve this problem, I think a lot of people have this idea that if we're at 100% renewable in, in 35 years, we're gonna be okay. Well, you know what? that horse is going to be long dead before we close the barn door. <laughs> we can't afford to pass this off to an unborn generation. This is, this is, that's appalling. I'm offended by the idea that we would extend that time horizon so far out. I would say, and I think we need to speak about it this way in public, during the next five years, what we do will define whether or not the lease is up for us on this planet. What we do in the next five years, not five, five years from now. Um, so how do we change, how do we change people's perception of, of their power in this, in this problem? One of the points that I, I'm, I've been harping on lately is, and friends of mine are getting tired of hearing it, we don't have political leaders in this country. We have a representative democracy. They are elected to represent us, not lead us. The citizens of this country lead us. We live our lives according to the laws, and we lead by our own examples. We don't need people in Ottawa to tell us how to live. And I'm not a libertarian. I, I vote on the left. Um, but I refuse to accept that somebody who's elected to represent my voice in Ottawa would be, would be described as my leader. Um, so it's a bit colonialist and a bit patriarchal to, to talk about it that way. Um, so I think over the next five years it's going to take all of us doing everything and some ba very basic solutions that I think we can implement are subsidies for distributed generation of um, electricity with rooftop solar on residences uh, and we can do that by subsidizing the purchase of the equipment for the consumers. We can give a tax holiday and training incentives for installers, and, and we can help uh, manufacturers set up to produce the products here. Um, and, and we have a national rebate program for electric vehicles, not just new vehicles, but used ones, because you can't sell new, new electric vehicles without a good used market. Um, so, Oh, okay, I, I, I see your finger waving me off. Um, so, home, home efficiency and all the things you mentioned, Tom, I think are important. But, but my point, my main point is let's not pass this off to a generation of people who have not even been born yet. The next five years, what we each do is what's going to count. I just want to say I agree with you around the thing about political leadership. I mean, essentially, you know, political leaders, the best of them, we have two good ones here, are, are followers. They need the people to stand in front of them, essentially, right? Very seldom do you have 
a political leader stand out in front of, you know, significantly far ahead of their population and their constituency. So the only way that things are going to actually happen is if we demand that our political leaders make it happen. And if we, we do that at the ballot box and we do that in between elections, and if we, we actually become the leaders and we ask the, the, our politicians to stand with us in our leadership. So I completely agree with that view. And I think part of the problem we've had up till now has been um, us waiting around for somebody else to do something. Yeah. There's nobody else. Whenever you get that sense, all you need to do is go look in the mirror. That's the person who's going to have to do something. Okay, thank you so much for hosting the event. My name is Celia Kelly and I live in Vic West. Um, I just wanted to bring up three potential solutions or actions that the federal government can take. So the first one is increasing infrastructure of public transportation, and I know that is already on the radar and there is budget for that, but I really do feel that public transportation has to be easier, more convenient than driving. Um, don't own a car and we are hoping to not own a car for as long as we possibly can. We don't have children yet. When we do, it's going to be scary to have a newborn baby in that little chariot behind us. So it'd be great if public transportation and infrastructure for bike lanes could be dra dramatically expanded so that we don't are, aren't forced to buy a car. Um, Buses. I know Victoria doesn't have the density for like rapid transportation, but buses, uh, rapid buses, dedicated bu bus lanes. I think we need to really be innovative with our resources to make transit as easy as possible. The other thing, I heard people talk about plane travel, and I'm guilty. I have family in very far away places, and I'm going to go. I, I need to see my family. But maybe uh, supporting research in making air travel more energy uh, efficient and you know, having grants for university scholars to do really innovative work to make that kind of transportation that's resource intensive more effective or efficient. Um, and the third thing I want to mention because of the importance of or the importance of our global partners and international partners and their role on these massive amounts of millions of metrics of tons that are far exceed our little BC province, is we really need to work with our partners internationally and getting them to have carbon taxes. And when we go to these international events, we really need to work on the Chinas and the Indias of the world to <coughs> encourage them to find mechanisms to reduce their emissions as well. So working with our partners internationally, because as much as we want our individuals to these change, changes to make a difference, we're going to have to work with them closely so that they don't want this coal, that they're incentivized to not use it, and so we need to work with them closely, and Canada has a big role to play in that. Before I make my main comment, I'd like to compliment um, Tom on the comments that he's made. I support all of the measures. Will, I'd like to compliment you on your observation about the significant impact of exports. I'd like to uh, compliment my MP for doing good work. I will make a point. I, I want to speak because I want to make a separate point about something that wasn't mentioned. And I'm disappointed it wasn't. And it has to do with population. One of the best, uh, most credible studies I'm aware of says that the world population at seven is about two times what is sustainable. Sustainable was about four billion passed in 1980. I'm, I'm disappointed that it wasn't mentioned because people have footprints. All of, every, every day when you wake up, there's 200,000 more than 200,000 plus more people living on the earth. That's two and a half candidates per year. My opinion is that all the measures that we've talked about tonight will be overwhelmed 
if the matter of population isn't dealt with. I realize that this is uh, not something you can you have control over, and I realize that the measures, the uh, population reduction, may be a long-term matter. For example, I'm, I'm not talking about extreme measures. I'm talking about long-term things like empowering women. But in the short term, I'm also talking about messaging. Every sector, of, almost every sector of society, including entrepreneurs, politicians, the media, the public, boasts about population growth. When there's a population decline in a, in a country or a community, they're viewed with pity. When it should be the opposite. There just are too many people. They have footprints. Not only do they cause climate change, but they cause uh, resource depletion and pollution. So I say again, unless that's dealt with, all these other measures will be overwhelmed by that. Stay back there and take my turn when it came, but it hello. Yeah, okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Frances Lippman. I'm a resident of the Squamal. Thank you for this evening. And I just wanted to um, tell you I share your sentiment, uh, Randall, about the Climate Action Government website. It looks like it's been bought by PR agencies working for the Liberal government, or for potentially the Conservatives, I'd say, because it is loaded with comments uh, relating to Can Canadians want pipelines, is what it says on the homepage. All the main posts are for pipelines, they're for the expansion of pipelines, they're for the oil industry. So I would encourage everybody in this room to go to that website and as, as junky as, as it is, um, make your post and we all have to do that. I'd also like to point out that one thing that has been overlooked is the um, high cost of shipping our stuff. Uh, the ships that are plying our oceans are burning the dirtiest bunker fuel in the world. As a result, there's actually a local filmmaker here by the name of Sarah Robertson, and we premiered her film at Creatively United this year. It's called Sea Blind, and she's willing to show it to any group, and if, you, if you're interested, you can see me afterwards. And basically, her documentary is showing how those ships that are plying our oceans right now are actually responsible for the Arctic sea ice loss because that dirty bunker fuel is landing on the ice. It's black, it's dirty, it's cancerous, it's filled with everything we don't want. And it is, like basically, there's no reflection for that ice. So it is melting at the fastest rate possible. And that not only is it cancerous, there are no rules or regulations around these ships, nothing. So they can burn whatever they like. And uh, as we know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. The people in James Bay spoke up when they found that the cruise ships were polluting their turf and some measures came into place. Now, once they leave the port, they can do whatever they like. And that isn't the case in all the ports that they visit. So it really is up to us to, to be the change. And the good news is that there's tons of good, great groups, thank you, Will, BCSCA, doing amazing work. So it's not like we're alone. We can get together on this. And we definitely need to think about where, if you have money invested, how your money is invested. Get it out of coal. Get it out of the, get it out of the resource sector, because that industry as well has a terrible reputation for slavery. They uh, have... <laughs> There's slaves all over the world, and we don't hear about that. And those people are, there's people enslaved in those industries. So, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Edgar Doherty. I'm, I recently moved to Victoria. And um, I want to just say that uh, the one thing that's been left out of this discussion about how bad the problem is, is how local the problem is. Um, I used to really enjoy um, going to beaches on Vancouver Island to get out to harvest oysters. And a few years back, I was wondering, you know, when going to places to camp on the beach, and wondering, 
why are there all these big, empty oyster shells and no young oysters? Is it just, are people harvesting oysters? They're only this big. And then it comes out in the media. This is ocean acidification. This is carbon dioxide from the fossil fuels that we've been burning too much of, acidifying the Salish Sea to the point that the shellfish industry is, well, basically on life support now. And a lot of people are giving up their, um, their oyster leases and leaving the industry right here on Vancouver Island. <laughs> um, so when I think about fossil fuel subsidies, I think about subsidizing the destruction of more jobs, like the, the shellfish jobs here on Vancouver Island. Um, and I'm a transportation planner, and one of the, the kinds of fossil fuel subsidies that, I, that irks me the most is all the money that's being spent by federal, provincial, and municipal governments to expand high carbon transportation. Yeah. Yeah. What's going on here with the $85 million for the McKenzie yeah. interchange? Yeah. $85 million when we were promised back in 2008 that we would have shoulder bus lanes. Where are the shoulder bus lanes out on the highway? Nowhere to be seen, but we get a freeway interchange yeah. when everybody knows that you can't build your way out of congestion and you're just building your way into more fossil fuel consumption. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a lot of federal infrastructure. The federal government is putting billions every year into urban freeway expansion. Uh, all over the all over Canada. They may, our, our local government may contribute money to the Massey, um, Massey Tunnel Replacement Project to replace a four-lane, perfectly adequate tunnel. It's good for another 50 years, just been upgraded. To replace it with a 10-lane bridge that will allow coal ships, as, as Will was mentioning, coal ships and LNG tankers to get into the Fraser River. Um, so what I really want, what I really want to focus on is that that's something that we don't all have a coal port to chain ourselves to, uh, right in our local communities. But we've got things, ridiculous things like this Mackenzie um, interchange being proposed. The people in Vancouver have the, the this massive bridge that's been proposed, and um, overall, my estimate for this is that in the province of BC, just from road transportation, we could reallocate one billion dollars a year, B, billion with a B, mm -hmm. from making the climate crisis worse to solutions. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that we to get up and actually raise their hands. <laughs> uh, we have to be out of the building at 9, that's, that's unfortunate, uh, for the number of people speak. So I'm going to suggest for those who are remaining, if, if it's okay, try to compress down to a minute and a half. You might be able to get everybody in. I'm going to ask the next woman in this line to come forward and continue alternating by gender. So I think it's important to hear from women equally. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I was at Globe as a reporter. Have many people been to Globe? This is the Greenwash conference that takes place in Vancouver. And there was a panel, there, there, there was two, three panels I'd like to refer to. One was the decarbonization panel with Shell. <laughs> the other one was um, Future of Sustainable, sustainable energy, and that was the Suncor and Enbridge. <laughs> and what I noticed was there is this code word, transition. They all talked about transition. So I said, well, I remember when the transition was. It was in 1976 in Vancouver, all along, all along the coastline in Jericho, where they had solar and wind. 
So when is the transition going to occur? They're going to keep saying there's going to be a transition, there's going to be a transition. And another, something that has concerned me over the years is that the U.S. several years ago managed to exempt the cost of militarism to greenhouse gas emissions. So I, it's estimated that it's at least 20%. And when we think of how much is spent on militarism, and someone was suggesting what we should do is transfer some of the funds into promoting, some of the subsidies into promoting a renewable energy. So I think that's really important. And, and, also, and one last thing, that I, I read in the, in the circular that you had, that you talk, it's, it, all the time it's mentioned that we're going to do something by 2050. Now, someone was mentioning this earlier, but I think we need to have a firm target, and you didn't want us to address target, no, just address this. Okay. That, uh, that the U, Canada went to COP21 with the same target that the, that the Conservatives had, and that was, um, I can't remember now, what it was, 20, uh, uh, they took, by 2030, and it was uh, below, so much below, 20%, I think, below 2005. Well, we should call upon the government to at least call for 25% below 2020, to, I'm sorry, 25% 20, below 1990 by the year 2020. And each year, because if we keep postponing it till 2050, we're not going to be doing anything. And I think that's extremely important. But yet the cynic in me came out and said, what's to stop our competitors from filling that void? By which I mean the United States, States, OPEC, you know, Central uh, America, and so on. And does it matter? Um, one of the things that's, probably the biggest thing that's happened in, 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 in the last 18 months that hardly anybody in Canada is talking about is what's happened in Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia has essentially said, um, you know, we're, if you look at what's happened, is they are keeping their production at, at historic levels. Almost every month, recently, they broke their previous record in terms of production. And the media in Canada is portraying that as this is an attempt to drive low price producers, I mean high cost producers, out of business. Principally geared towards, um, towards the, you know, the, the backing in, uh, in, the, in the fracking that's happening in, in, in North Dakota and other places in the United States. So that's the, that's the conventional story that's being told. There's a hell of a lot more going on than just that. Um, essentially, if you track, if you, list, if you read non-North American sources, you'll hear occasionally the Saudi person say, look it, we think the end of oil, the era of oil is about to end, come, come to the end. And we are going to end that era of oil with not a drop of oil left in the ground. Yeah. So the reason they're keeping production up, and the reason I think they will continue to keep production up, is because they're a low-cost producer, they can outcompete everybody else, they will sell all of their oil down to the last drop. And their goal is, in the very near future, when they think that the era is over, they won't have any left in the ground, so they'll have used their, all their entire reserves. If that is true, and it looks increasingly every month like that is true, what it means is the Canadian oil industry is toast. It means that there's just no way that they can compete at that price level. Which means that the only way that they're going to be able to even stay in the game is massive amounts of subsidies. So the, the story in the near future is going to be massive attempts to subsidize high cost Canadian energy extraction to maintain the, the, our role in terms of market share in the, in the broader world. So that's a real battle, and nobody in Canada is talking about it. 
The good news is all we got to do is buy ourselves a little bit of time around these infrastructure projects. Because the, the, the world economy and the, the economics of oil will actually put them out of business pretty quickly. So if we can buy a couple more years here, I think we're in a, in a pretty good place to not have to play that game. Uh, carbon pollution 
And Iceland uh, is already doing something like that, so maybe you should uh, look into Iceland what they're doing. But there's all these other ways of sequestering carbon and storing carbon, like trees. Yeah. <laughs> student at the University of Victoria in the Environmental Studies Department. Um, I'm here helping to organize with the People's Climate Plan. These three major uh, points are that we need uh, a national strategy based on science, which means 80% of fossil fuels need to stay in the ground. 100% um, renewable energy economy by 2050 is the deadline, but definitely I support what everyone else has said about being uh, in the next five years, those being the crucial years for climate change. Uh, and I want to emphasize the importance of a justice-based transition throughout this um, that respects indigenous rights, that uh, promotes renewable energy opportunities uh, for those who have been working in the fossil fuel sector. Um, and I also just want to add quickly that um, I'd like to see uh, federal support for campaigns like the divestment movement that are aiming challenges and part of that is uh, we need to sort of reopen our um, municipal and provincial uh, investment strategies to, to facilitate uh, opportunities for divestment at all levels. So, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Graham Verholtz and I'm an architect and one of the reasons why I ended up in this profession is because I realized that um, our choices are our own only to the extent that the infrastructure allows us to make them. Um, and so, uh, like I've been at the table for decisions around uh, design of buildings that are going to last 25 to 50 years, even 100 years, uh, being informed not by our aspirations and values of where we want to be in that time frame, but by the momentum of decisions that were made a half century ago. And I think that it's really important for us to realize what is um, informing the decisions that we're making now. And it plays into the pipeline debates, but it also plays into the debates about our political systems. I will, I really appreciated that um, diagram with the fish, but I think we need to question, why is it that we're swimming with sharks? That is the result of design decisions that we've made, that we're living with, that we made at a time when none of us were even alive. We're living in a much too old system and we're letting uh, the design of previous generations affect us today and it's obviously no longer serving us. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, the comment I immediately wanted to make had to do with the gentleman's uh, reference to uh, to carbon capture and storage and sequestration, and uh, I, I I know we do need to uh, to look at technological development. I think we also have to be very careful of the kind of technological uh, development that's always over the horizon. Carbon capture and storage is you know, enormously difficult problem because the volumes of carbon are enormous. If you burn one ton of coal, you end up with three and a half tons roughly of carbon dioxide. And trying to catch that out of the air and stuff it back in the earth is going to be a heck of a big problem. So, um, so, so that's my immediate response. Are, are, is this my time for it just closing? Uh, I don't. I don't think I have a lot more to say. I was just very impressed by all the ideas that came forward. Uh, you people seem to understand the issues really very well, and I just reinforced that um, 
uh, e even though there's a lot of skepticism of the process and our leaders, uh, this is our chance somehow to find a way to make our voices heard. Uh, we can move the conversation, we can uh, talk to the media and push them along as well. There's a lot of sort of reactionary or regressive uh, talk in the media these days. If we push them, they'll slowly become a little bit more uh, progressive and move the conversation so that we can really start talking about the real solutions and not kind of keep things over. So thank you again for, uh, for coming tonight. Thanks for your time. Just to follow on the comment around, you know, the decisions, living with decisions made a long time ago. That's called path dependence. And we're stuck in a lot of those path dependencies where choices were made and we're trying to make the best of them. Ultimately, you know, just is going to take political will to overcome that. I wanted to read something that I wrote just about 10 years ago um, when we started the, the tanker campaign. Because I think it's relevant to put this in context. So bear with me for just a second here. So this is what I wrote. Some time ago, Western civilization faced a crisis of unprecedented proportions, a crisis that had profound impacts on the future of the world, a crisis driven by Western Europe and North America, but that impacted the fate of millions in Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. The politics were bare-knuckled. Opponents asserted change would have devastating economic consequences. Proponents emphasized the moral imperatives. Proponents claimed that the world, that change would destroy the economy, putting thousands, no millions, out of work. They said, they too are concerned that the change must be carefully considered and phased in gradually. They said special exemptions must be made to ensure existing industries didn't shoulder an unfair burden. They sought to delay implementation and to exempt or create ex exceptions for certain industries. Opponents funded challenges to the science and the economics. They funded public relations claims, claiming propo proposals would disrupt uh, food supplies, advantage competing nations, reduce the standard of living of the average person, devastated coastal port cities, and threaten the nation's security. Opponents urge caution, further studies, half measures, and in their increasingly transparent attempts to preserve the status quo. It was the definitive political battle of its time. Anybody know what this is about? Sorry, guy. No, well, good one. <laughs> the political and economic elites, fat on the excesses driven by the status quo, resisted most strongly. They sought to continue to get rich on the subsidies. They hoped to continue amassing enormous fortunes from permissive policies. And officers and directors of the companies they made money from, um, from continued exploitation. As shareholders, they demanded continued double-digit growth. But slowly over a generation, the tide changed. Opponents resisted bitterly, first with denials, then tacit acknowledgments, followed by pleas for further study, then non-binding solutions, then half-baked legislation filled with ex exceptions. But the people, led by a few heroes, couldn't be ignored. The grassroots move for change was driven by churches and intellectuals. They held rallies, signed petitions. Slavery. After slavery, after decades of sweat and blunders, they succeeded. Slavery was abolished, first in France, then in England and its empire, and finally in the US, 50 years later. The world economy didn't collapse and done. Western civilization didn't disappear. The European and British empires ruled the world for another 150 years. So the point was that politicians didn't lead those battles. It was people. People just demanded that this kind of thing happen, and they wouldn't take no for an answer, and it took them a long time. And we don't have generations like they did, but we can learn from their lessons, and that's what it's going to actually take. much, Randall. Um, I've got a lot of thanks to give here tonight. First of all, Randall, thanks for inviting us from Victoria and Vic West and Oak Bay even to come and be part of this event. We really appreciate it. Secondly, I want to thank uh, both Will and, and, and Tom for your excellent presentations. And I guess I just particularly need to thank Vaughn, wherever you are, for, for your technical assistance. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, and of course, most of all, you for coming out on a Friday night on such a crucial issue as this. Um, I don't want to be skeptical either. I want to give this a chance. The Canada.ca climate action present, uh, document that you heard about earlier is an opportunity 
to plug into this, but don't necessarily go there. Send it to both Randall and myself on our websites. I'm going to be uh, doing a household survey in late June on climate change. We have to hear from you. We want to make sure that the voices of this region are taken into account as Canada grapples with this. And I was struck with the sense of urgency and passion and the, and the amount of knowledge in this room. It really is quite remarkable. This community always has that, that level of engagement. And this is the issue of our generation, let's be clear. We cannot let this opportunity pass us by. The cynicism that led to the Kyoto uh, Agreement and Canada's perspective on that cannot be what follows from our participation in the, the Paris Agreement. We have the Vancouver Declaration, we have, it seems, a commitment as a country to move forward on this, but it's going to take people like you pushing people like us to get the job done and treat it with the sense of urgency that I heard in this room tonight. So thank you very much. I like the idea that we're talking about practical steps. I took a lot of information about some very practical and effective steps. I hope you found it a useful event. Thanks so much for coming out. So good night everyone.